Hi, good afternoon. I'm Matthew Larkin, and as Simon mentioned, today's presentation relates to lithium battery safety. So we'll be covering uh, the basic construction of the cell, example tests that you would perform to show compliance, and uh, safety mechanisms that are featured in the cell and the battery pack. The lithium battery can be traced back as far as uh, 1912 due to the work of the chemist Gilbert Newton, but it was not until the 1970s when lithium primary batteries became commercially available. And another 20 years further in the 1990s when secondary lithium ion batteries became available through the work of um, such people as John uh, Goodenough and his contemporaries. So why do design engineers choose lithium ion to power their products? One reason is energy density, which is a measure that can be made to compare battery chemistries to partly aid designers to choose the appropriate um, battery for application, the correct chemistry. Basically, the two main parameters for determining this are gravimetric energy, which is calculated by the capacity of the battery divided by the weight of the battery, uh, volumetric energy, which is calculated by the capacity of the battery divided by the volume of the battery. Typically, for a portable application, such as a mobile phone, you are looking for a high energy density, which means uh, the battery's got the ability to hold energy uh, and have a long run time, which results, hopefully, in a lighter, smaller battery compared to a battery of a another chemistry of a similar capacity. Power density is another uh, key performance indicator and that is related to energy density and is the ability of the battery to deliver power on demand, which is advantageous in power tool applications and also transportation. These uh, parameters tend to be optimistic, but nevertheless they give an indication of um, the battery, but other important parameters are needed, are needed to be considered too, such as uh, battery, life, battery life cycle, which basically means uh, after your battery is being continually charged and discharged, how long does it retain that um, capacity or charge before it becomes not fit for purpose? And if you look at the graph, you can see that generally the better uh, energy density will be um, moving up and towards the right of the graph, meaning it's smaller and lighter, which you can see lithium ion uh, is located in that region of the chart. Another uh, key advantage of lithium ion is the nominal uh, voltage, which is considerably higher than comparable batteries such as uh, nickel metal hydride, which is typically 1.2 volts. Uh, lithium ion has the standard nominal uh, voltage of 3.7. Also, self-discharge is, is an important aspect. Uh, basically, if the product's left in a not-used state, uh, how long does it retain its charge for? And as you can see, typically it only loses 5% on uh, around 5% in a month compared to, say, nickel metal hydride, which is 30%. So, an overview of um, kind of the advantages and disadvantages. As we, as we mentioned, it has a high energy density compared to other battery chemistries such as nickel metal hydride. It has a compact package and size weight, um, which is brilliant for obviously portable consumer applications, but also has advantages in larger applications because obviously you'd like to keep the power source to the smallest size possible, so it gives you the greatest flexibility in design. As I mentioned before, so low discharge rate compared to other rechargeable battery chemistries, which means um, it can be left longer and retain its charge. There are some disadvantages with lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion uh, batteries are obviously sensitive to temperature, and because the chemistry tends to be a bit more complex than some of the traditional chemistries, more advanced uh, protection is required against such conditions as overcharge, over discharge, over temperature. Also, um, because the chemistry is uh, more active maybe than some other chemistries, 
more extensive testing needs to be done to ensure that the product is safe. Production costs tend to be, of the actual manufacturing of the cell, tends to be slightly higher than other chemistry types. Today, lithium-ion batteries can be found in a variety of industries and applications, ranging from consumer products, such as a small battery pack used in a mobile phone, to automotive applications, such as a large battery pack in a hybrid car. As well as consumer and automotive industries, it's also popular in medical uh, environments, such as portable ventilators. Uh, it has military applications, such as using in radios, uh, bomb disposal rob um, robots. And also, it finds its way into aerospace industry, um, powering satellites and providing auxiliary power for aircraft. The lithium ion cell that is used in the actual battery pack can be found in three main types. The first type is the cylindrical, such as the 18650, which refers to the size of the cell and was the uh, first lithium ion cell to market. The prismatic was next to market, followed by the pouch cell, also known as the laminated cell. This cell is, has be made a big, a big impact in the cell industry due to the fact that the closure is fi uh, flexible and is considerably slimmer and lighter than conventional prismatic and cylindrical cells. The general construction of the cell is very similar, um, except for the electrodes, which for cylindrical cells are jelly rolls when inserted into the enclosure or the can, as it's sometimes known as, um, whereby prismatic and pouch, for example, tend to be uh, in a stacked configuration before being placed in the end enclosure. The basic operation of the lithium ion cell is once the cell is fully charged, uh, the graphite anode on the left of the diagram will contain lithium ions. During discharge, these ions, ions will then travel through the electrolyte to the cathode on the right of the diagram which will result in current flow through the product that the battery is powering. When the uh, cell is recharged, the opposite will occur. Current will then flow, well, current will, will then be forced in the opposite direction, and the ethylene ions will return to the anode uh, from the cathode on the right. The cell consists of, main, uh, of uh, three main parts, which are the electrode, the separator, and the electrolyte. The electrode in modern lithium ion cells does not actually contain lithium metal uh, due to instability during uh, cycling. Today, the electrodes are in fact made from materials such as lithium carbonate, which is on for the cathode, and typically for the anode would be made of uh, graphite. The selection uh, of the electrode material is important for capacity, so to maximize capacity, the voltage, energy, and power capability of the cell. So it's a key um, uh, selection point. Uh, the other, the second key construction area is the separator. The main function of the separator is to isolate the positive and the negative electrodes and to retain the electrolyte. Uh, so the uh, ions can flow through the, uh, the separator on the basis that the separator is semi-porous. Semi the separator is very thin, but it needs to be uh, resistant to puncture by burrs on the electrode plate and has to have good insulation uh, properties, mechanical strength, uh, chemical and thermal stability. Uh, the electrolyte is an organic solution, or solvent, sorry, which is often, often lithium salt rather than water-based electrolyte, which is used in other chemistries such as alkaline cells. And this has basically the function of carrying lithium ions and so producing current flow. It is a conductive, a highly conductive uh, solvent, uh, which has a high temperature range. Um, so a key difference between an electrolyte in a lithium ion cell and one that's in a, say, an alkaline cell or a nickel metal hydride cell is 
because it is an actual solvent, it has the potential to be highly uh, flammable uh, when it comes into contact with air and has the uh, potential to release a lot of heat. Often you'll hear the words lithium ion and lithium ion polymer. Uh, so the question is, is what is the difference between these two types of cell? And basically it's the electrode, which in, uh, sorry, yeah, the electrolyte, sorry, uh, which tends to be of a, in, in a polymer cell, is more of a gel, so it has minimal liquid, which has the effect of reducing the potential for flammability. And also, uh, it's often used in pouch cells, as and as mentioned before, this enhances the flexibility of the cell over traditional cell manufacturing processes. Lithium ion batteries have had negative press, particularly during 2005 and 2008 time, when relatively high incident rates occurred, resulting in fires and explosions. This resulted in costly product recalls for major manufacturers, which ran into millions of pounds. These type of incidents also have the potential to damage company reputations, which take decades to earn, but days to lose. In extreme cases, it could be possible that legal action could be, uh, could be uh, followed if due diligence could not be shown that consideration has been given to the potential danger and appropriate measures taken uh, to demonstrate the product's safe. So there's been lots of, uh, in, uh, over the few years, a lot of uh, the public has seen negative stories relating to the, uh, the production of lithium ion. So as stats show from the FAA, which regulates um, American aircraft, that between uh, 1991 and uh, 2011, there have been 118 incidents relating to batteries. And this basically just covers America alone or American registered aircraft. So you can see that there have been quite a few incidents. So what are the reasons behind these incidents? As there's a lot of pressure on the cell um, and battery manufacturers to uh, increase uh, capacity and reduce size, there's a lot of design uh, pressure on the design tolerances of the cell or the battery pack. Many of the high profile incidents involving laptop computers in 2006, 2007 were linked to potentially inadequate manufacturing procedures whereby contaminate contaminants were introduced into the production process. These were metal, metal particles which pe penetrated the separator and caused an internal short circuit between the cathode and the anode, which resulted in thermal runaway. Another area of concern for manufacturers is the use of non-genuine batteries and chargers. Consumers are always, after, uh, always tempted by cheaper, lower pricing so when their battery is faulty or their charger no longer works, they will find a, 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 an alternative part that may not be recommended by the manufacturer without realising what the real safety implications are. And um, also, people tend to try to use chargers and maybe batteries that are not actually intended for the application. Also, as I mentioned before, protection circuitry is very important on lithium-ion batteries. So sometimes it can be uh, caused by inadequate charging or protection circuitry, either in the end product itself or the actual battery. So how do you select an appropriate battery standard to test your product against? There are, are a number of things to consider. Uh, first off is the actual uh, chemistry of the cell itself. A lead acid battery will obviously be tested will tend to be tested to a different standard than an alkaline battery and also another uh, issue is the classification of the battery whether it's rechargeable or non-chargeable uh, this will make a difference so for example if you have a, a portable uh, lithium-ion battery that will be tended to be tested against IEC 62133 whereas if you had a portable uh, metal battery uh, lithium metal battery that tends to be tested against IEC 60086-4 because that's a non-chargeable battery. 
Also, end application makes a difference as well. So if you have a, a lithium-ion cell that's used in a consumer product, a portable consumer product, again, IEC 62133 would be applicable. But if you were uh, going to use a, a lithium-ion cell in an electric vehicle, uh, appropriate standard maybe to consider would be IEC 62660. Another important area is the target market. So if you, you need to know which country your, your product is going to be uh, sold in. So for example, often, uh, for example, if you sell your products in America, often UL standards are applicable rather than IEC or EN standards. Also, some countries have particular legislation that needs to be adhered to. So for example, in Japan, certain types of batteries need to comply to the Japanese PSE certification requirements. Also, some industries have their own requirements as well. So, for example, in America, uh, GSM and 3G network operators require portable cellular products such as a mobile phone and their batteries to meet CTIA requirements, which is a, a trade organization. And the testing that is undertaken for this type of uh, Certification is based on standards such as IEEE 1625 and IEEE 1725. Another key point to distinguish between standards is often the standards are split between product safety or abuse testing and performance testing. So it's always worth um, having in your mind what your objective is to the testing. So are you um, solely concerned with safety? performance or both. So quite often you will find there are two standards for your particular type of device um, which cover these two areas. It's also important to think of the complete system. So as we mentioned here, if you look at the, di the diagram, on the left you can see the bare cell. So often that would be tested against the UN Manual of Tests. Uh, for worldwide access and European access, it would be tested against 62133. And if you want to also sell your mobile phone product in the States, UL 1642 would be applicable. Moving on to the complete battery pack, again, the UN Manual of Test would be applicable, as well as IEC EN 62133. But this time, the appropriate American standard would be, for example, UL 2054. Uh, this is, and then you have the end product when you get to the end product, you need to think of uh, the, the integration of the pack into, into the end product, such as the mobile phone. So again, the mobile phone would be uh, tested against IEC 6950 or UL 6950. And the testing in the end product, as well as, um, would mainly more center on the interaction between the phone and the pack. So it would check that the correct uh, charging algorithm would be initiated, so it checks that the correct vo uh, charge voltage and charge current are applied at the correct point, and this would be checked in the 6950 standard to see that it meets the pack specification. So another important point to make is when you're designing your end product is to make sure that your end product specification ties up with the cell specification and the pack specification. This diagram shows basically common modes of failure for lithium ion batteries that should be considered when designing your battery and also the end product itself. One of the uh, failure modes is uh, our internal shorts in the cell. These are difficult to control once they occur. Internal shorts uh, are generally caused by such things as poor cell manufacturing process that allows small metal particles into the production process and that has the potential to penetrate uh, the separator. Also, other manufacturing defects, such as poor electrode alignment or cell tab insulation, which basically, if, they, if this isn't correct, also causes short circuits. Denerites, which are metal fibers that form on the carbon nanodes, cause, are caused by uh, poor fast charging or discharging, so basically excessive charging above the limits. And this has basically has the potential to compromise the separ separated material. So basically, these metal fibers form on the anode. And basically, because they grow on the, uh, on 
the on the anode uh, basically eventually puncture through the actual separating material itself, so causing a short circuit between the anode and the cathode. Also, impact, which could be um, in maybe a, um, impact, which could be maybe caused by crushing, which could occur maybe if an electric vehicle is involved in an accident, or even something as simple as if a mobile phone battery is dropped on the floor. Basically, this can disturb the inside of the cell and cause short circuits. Operating the battery in ex extreme external conditions, whether it's hot or cold, can also cause chemical imbalance, which can cause, for example, gas buildup, an increase in internal resistance, an increase in, uh, in terms of internal resistance, an increase in also internal temperature, which can result uh, finally in thermal runaway. On to the, to the right side of the uh, uh, diagram, you can see possible end scenarios, such as venting. Uh, venting, to a certain extent, is, is, is a desirable result if, say, there's a, a tense uh, build-up of pressure, because basically this means that the uh, pressure within inside the cell can be released in a controlled manner, which will not result in an explosion. But obviously, you need to design your battery and the end product carefully, because obviously you don't want venting to regularly occur. This would obviously only be in the extreme situations. And basically, the main things that we don't want to happen to our, our battery pack are such things as rupture, whereby the actual enclosure splits and the internals of the battery are exposed. So this could result in electrolyte leakage, which is corrosive, and, uh, which is an corrosive um, substance, which is obviously not desirable. Um, in worst cases, obviously, fire can occur, and the worst possible scenario, an explosion could occur. So basically, this identifies the fact that you need to design protection circuit carefully to minimise this potential um, hazard occurring. A lot of the test standard, uh, a lot of the tests in the standard are, are similar. Uh, with, may, with maybe minor variations such as the length of the test or the temperature at which the test is performed. Some of the common tests that you will find in battery test standards uh, for safety are such tests as short circuit, abnormal charging, discharging, and vibration testing. Some, stand, uh, some standards, however, have particular tests that are not so common such as, for example, um, SA, SAE J2464, which is an automotive standard. And this has some particular tests that are relevant to the automotive industry, which include uh, the pen a penetration test, whereby a 3 millimeter steel rod is used to penetrate right through the cell. And basically what they're looking for here is does the... Does the uh, cell just uh, vent uh, and maybe catch fire, or does it actually explode, which probably wouldn't be a, a desirable effect. Um, another test that the SAE standard includes is a, a test called the rollover test, whereby uh, a module, which is a, a collection of cells, or, or a complete pack, which is a collection of several modules, is slowly rotated uh, in 90 degree increments and held for one hour. And basically what they're looking for in this test is basically any leakage, electrolyte leakage, to make sure that the end enclosure is firmly sealed to prevent any undesirable electrolyte leakage. Other standards that could be, uh, other tests that are performed are, for example, EMC tests. These tend to be um, uh, tested for, uh, for more complex circuits. So for a basic... Um, for a basic mobile phone battery, for example, you may just only do an ESD, electric static discharge test. But for more complex battery uh, packs, such as ones that are used uh, in electric vehicles, a more stringent and detailed uh, EMC tests are required, such as radiated immunity uh, and emissions. So basically, does it generate emissions? Is it immune to its surroundings? Um, surrounding emissions that might be uh, present in the car, which can be quite complex. There's also 
the more performance-related tests, such as uh, life cycle testing, as I mentioned before. So check how how um, how well the battery pack lasts under continuous use. So sometimes it may be the case that, um, especially in the automotive industry, whereby they have um, test profiles of typically charging and discharging under braking, acceleration, stopping. And basically this gives an idea to the design, it uh, gives a good feel to the design engineer that this battery pack product would be suitable in a real world environment. An example standard what we have chosen today is the UM manual of tests. This is a good uh, standard to look into because this is required irrespective of the end application or if it is a battery or a cell or whether it's primary or secondary. The standard is essential to help demonstrate that your cell or battery is safe for transportation and applies, and applies for whether it's being transported by land, sea or air. And it's required by such organisations as AATA or AIA. Or A IATA. Um, basically, this applies whether it's a, uh, a primary or a secondary cell or battery. Um, it's recommended that if you are um, designing a battery pack, is to source cells that already meet the UN manual of test requirements. Because basically, this minimises the testing that you have to do on the pack, which obviously saves you time but also money. Um, the scope of the UM manual test is quite wide, so it applies from anything from a little uh, coin cell that you might find in your watch right through to uh, EV electric vehicle modules. The UN class classifies dangerous goods into basically nine categories, with lithium metal and uh, lithium iron cells and batteries falling into category nine. Uh, category of class, uh, class 9, category 9, is basically a catch-all category for goods that do not fit into other categories, such as uh, UN Class 1 would be explosives, such as dynamite, um, whereas Class 7 would be something like uranium for radioactive material. So basically there's lots of different classifications for UN classified dangerous goods, and uh, lithium metal and lithium iron falls into Class 9. For compliance to UN requirements, lithium batteries are classified as either lithium ion or metal, and also an important aspect is um, how they are transported, whether they are transported on their own, whether they're fitted into equipment, or whether they're actually packed with, packed with equipment. The UN requirements, such as uh, UN 3480, are then referenced out to what's known as packing notes, for example, uh, 965 and basically these um, they apply for the type of transportation so in this instance the packing note refers to air transportation basically for air transportation the packing notes have basic common general requirements so the requirement is that it must actually meet the UN manual of testing criteria waste uh, batteries um, being transported by air for recycling and disposal uh, are not permitted unless approval is sought from the country of origin and the country of the airline operator. Cells that are defective in terms of safety returns, so there's a safety problem with the cell or battery, are forbidden for air transportation. Also, the battery must, or the cell must have uh, be protected from short circuits. So this could be um, the act within the actual battery pack itself, but also the material, so it must be securely packed in um, packing material, and uh, consideration must be given to the fact that this must not be conductive packaging material. When packed within equipment, the general requirement is that accidental activation must be prevented. So if you are uh, transporting, a, say, a rack system or something like that, that, uh, that um, has batteries in it, it's best to isolate the battery. Um, if it's um, uh, embedded into the actual product itself uh, and it has an on-off switch, it's quite a good idea maybe to design packaging that presents, uh, prevents 
the switch from accidentally becoming, uh, going on to the on position. The packing notes are basically divided into two categories, which are regulated class 9 and exempted. Um, exempted basically is classified as cells that have a, a rating of less than 20 watt hours for a rechargeable battery or uh, for a, uh, a primary cell it would have a lithium content of less than one gram. For batteries it would be for rechargeable uh, less than 100 watt hours or less than two grams lithium content. In this case, there would then be less stringent packaging requirements. So basically, the, the main requirement in terms of packaging for exempt would be that once it's, it, it needs to be packed, obviously, in strong packaging material. Uh, and then basically, the package, including the, the cell or the battery inside, would then be dropped from uh, 1.2 meters. And basically, this would result in no damage to the contents or shifting of the contents that allows contact between the cells or packs, uh, and also release of the actual contents of the package. Class 9, um, which is obviously the more hazardous type of product, basically must have a safety vent press, um, present and be packed in Class 2, what's known as Class 2 packaging. Uh, basically, Class 2 is classified as a medi uh, medium danger, Class 1 is a high danger, and Class 3 is low danger products. The UN transportation requirements require clear labelling of the packaging, detailing what's actually inside, warnings for safe handling for handling crews at the airport, for example, and identification of any potential hazards. The exact label requirements are detailed in the particular packing note, so it's always advisable to actually read the packing note that's applicable to your product. Certain countries, couriers and carriers have additional labelling and documentation requirements as well as weight limitation and restrictions that are in addition to the basic UN requirement. So again, it's always worth um, discussing with your uh, airline or courier if they ha have any additional requirements other than those detailed in the UN requirements. For example, in the United States, lithium metal batteries or cells are prohibited for transportation in plastic passenger planes. So the uh, orange label to the right should be affixed to the packaging of lithium metal batteries or cells. And basically this is detailed in the US Department of Transport's 49 CFR regulations. And this is again detailed in the UN's country deviations under USG02. Lithium metal cells or batteries uh, can be fitted in the actual equipment or packed with equipment and are, per are permitted for transportation on passenger aircraft which are bound for or within the US under certain restrictions such as a limitation of the actual lithium uh, content of the anode for primary batteries and also um, no spare batteries are allowed to be uh, packed within the equipment too. The UN Manual of Testing criteria is set out uh, as a set of eight tests covering environmental, mechanical and electrical tests to demonstrate compliance for safe transportation. The tests are often known as T1, T2, T3 tests. Uh, so for T1, that would refer to the altitude test. Tests T1 to T5 are applied to all types of lithium cell and batteries whether they are primary or secondary. Tests T6 and T8 are only applied to actual cells, and T7 is only applicable for rechargeable batteries. Revision 5 of the UN Manual Testing Criteria came into force at the beginning of the year, and mainly addresses the use of lithium-ion batteries and lithium batteries in large applications such as electric vehicles. So basically it introduced the, um, some new classifications. So it in, uh, in, introduced the classification large cell, which for a lithium ion battery would um, have an, uh, a rating of higher than 150 watt hours 
and if it was a lithium metal batch, uh, cell, it would have a lithium anode content of greater than 12 grams. Um, it also introduced the large battery category, which is any battery that has a gross weight of more than 12 kilograms. Battery assemblies, it classified large battery, it classifies large battery assemblies for uh, lithium ion as anything greater than uh, 6,200 watt hours. Uh, and for lithium metal primary batteries, uh, lithium anode content of greater than 500 grams. So what is the significance? Basically for larger, for rechargeable larger batteries, less test samples are required. Limited testing is required for small battery assemblies, so only one sample is required, and limited testing on that one sample would be the T3, T4, T5, and T7 tests. If uh, the cells that are, and batteries um, that are used within the assembly pass all the relevant tests. So basically, the cell that, or battery that is used in the battery assembly still needs to meet all the relevant requirements. It's only the end battery assembly that the limited testing is performed on. Also, uh, for large battery assemblies, such as um, battery packs that are used in EVs, um, there are no test requirements uh, if, the battery, if the EV battery module has passed all the tests, as long as the actual large battery assembly is monitored by a system which prevents short circuits or over-discharge conditions as well as overheating or overcharging conditions. So basically it means um, if, you're, if the modules used inside your EV battery pack have been fully tested and you have a battery management system that prevents short circuits, that the, you do not have to actually do any testing for the UM manual test for the actual uh, battery pack. The table sh this table basically shows the sample requirements for tests and it depends on whether it's a cell, a battery, and if it's a primary or secondary uh, cell or battery. Uh, tests one to five, or T1 to T5, are performed on all, all the same, uh, are performed on the same samples. But for tests T6, T7, and T8, different, a different set of samples can be used for each test. Uh, for prismatic cells, an additional five samples are required for the impact test, T6. So basically this is required because five samples will be tested along the longitudinal axis and uh, another five samples will be tested along the other axes when the impact applies. For larger rechargeable batteries, which are more than 12 kilograms, only four samples are required instead of the eight for batteries that are under 12 kilograms, as indicated by the red text and the samples are only cycled 25 times rather than 50 for the smaller battery packs. Okay, so um, the first test as mentioned was T1, which is altitude simulation. And basically this is a low pressure altitude test that evaluates uh, the ability of the cell or the pack to withstand conditions within, for example, a cargo hold at 50,000 feet. The test item is placed within the chamber at 11.6 uh, kilopascals for uh, six hours at room temperature. And basically the requirement is that the sample must not catch fire, it must not disassemble. Uh, in the context of the UN manual of test, uh, disassemble means uh, venting or rupture which results in solid matter passing through a wire mesh. So basically when this test is performed, it's enclosed in a wire mesh, and if any, um, if it uh, disassembles and solid matter passes through that metal mesh, it's uh, classed as a failure. Uh, also, it mustn't uh, vent. So basically venting means a controlled release of pressure from the cell through the cell's uh, vent mechanism. Uh, the other requirement is no uh, mass loss, so the UN uh, standard requires uh, the mass to remain the same after the test as it was before test, and there's quite a tight tolerance. So, for example, it mustn't lose more than 0.1% of the original value. Another requirement is it mustn't vent, uh, it mustn't rupture, sorry. 
And basically this means a mechanical failure of the uh, enclosure which would expose the contents of the cell or, or battery. So that could include uh, electrolyte leakage. Uh, the T2 test is the thermal test, and basically this tests the cell or the battery's uh, seal integrity and also the internal connections when uh, exposed to temperature extremes. Basically, um, these temperature extremes are maintained for six hours. So basically, um, the chamber is ramped up to 75 degrees and held there for six hours. Uh, then it is lowered to minus 40 degrees. And basically the transition between 75 and minus 40 is it must happen within 30 minutes. And basically this is done 10 times. Uh, and then it's left uh, in, at room temperature for 24 hours before the pass criteria is evaluated. So again, no fire, disassembly, leakage, venting, mass loss or rupture must occur. And again, the open, uh, and again, uh, the, the open voltage must be within 90% of the pretest voltage. Um, next test is T3, which is the vibration test, uh, and basically this is to replicate or simulate vibration that could occur during transportation. And basically, the sample is uh, clamped securely without influencing the test onto the test table that you can see uh, on the right. And basically, it's uh, swept through um, some frequency ranges. So it starts at 7 hertz and rises to 200 hertz and back down to 7 hertz in a 15-minute in a duration. Uh, this uh, test is repeated, this cycle is repeated 12 times in three hours. And basically, it's repeated at three mutually particular planes. One of those directions will be perpendicular to the actual terminal phase. Uh, it involves peak accelerations of 1G between the frequencies of 7 to 18 hertz and increases to 8G uh, between uh, 18 and 200 hertz. Again, the pass criteria is the same, no fire, disassembly, leakage, venting, mass loss or, or rupture. And the uh, open circuit voltage at the end of the test must be within 90% of the voltage that you measured at the start of the test. The T4 test is the shock test. Basically, this uh, simulates the uh, impacts that could occur during the transportation of the cell or the battery. Um, of the cell or the battery. Basically, this is a half sine shock at 150 g for six milliseconds for small cells and batteries. Um, that is uh, decreased in terms of g-force to 50, but the duration is increased to 11 milliseconds for larger cells and batteries. Basically, three shocks are applied in each direction uh, and, and for three mutually perpendicular mounting positions to cover the X, Y, Z axis. So basically, a total of 18 shocks are performed on each cell or battery. Again, the pass criteria is um, no fire, disassembly, leakage, venting, mass loss or, or rupture, and the open circuit voltage must again be 90% of the voltage, uh, the pretest voltage. The T5 test is the external short circuit test, and this is basically to represent a short, uh, short circuit on the positive and negative terminals, which results in a high current being drawn. Basically, the test procedure is to place the um, test item in the chamber at 55 degrees, and the short, um, shorting method must create a resistance of less than 100 milliohms. So the shorting method isn't actually described in the standard, so it can be any method that you choose that creates um, a resistance of less than 100 milliohms. So, for example, it could be a high-voltage current relay. The test duration... It's basically one hour after the uh, enclosure uh, temperature returns to 55. Um, so basically this means that the battery is placed in the chamber. You monitor the, uh, the temperature, and as soon as uh, the enclosure of the cell or the battery returns back down to 55 degrees, that's the end of the test after one hour of that occurring. After that, you um, observe the 
sample, test sample for six hours, and uh, you check for the past criteria of no fire, no disassembly, and no rupture. In this case, it is permitted to um, for the battery or cell to vent um, during the uh, the duration of the complete test, the case temperature must never exceed 170 degrees. Next test is uh, the impact test, and this basically um, applies to cells only. Basically, the cell is positioned on a flat surface, um, and basically uh, a metal bar is placed across the cell. Its diameter is 15.8 uh, millimetres, then um, a 9.1 kilogram weight is dropped from a height of 61 centimetres onto the cell. It's only one impact per cell. Um, basically, six hours after the test, you check that there is um, no fire, no disassembly, and during the course of the test, obviously, there should be no fire or disassembly, and also during the entire test process, the uh, cell enclosure must not exceed 170 degrees. The next test is the T7 test, which is the overcharge test. This is basically to test the ability of the pack to withstand an overcharge condition. So you basically need to check the manufacturer's specification. So basically the test method is to um, set the charge current to two times the maximum um, two times the maximum recommended char uh, continuous charge current uh, of the pack. Uh, the voltage is set to either two times the manufacturer's recommended uh, continuous charge voltage or 22 volts, whichever is the lower of the two. If um, the rated voltage or the rated recommended continuous charge voltage is greater than 18 volts, the, the uh, test voltage ratio is reduced to one and a half times rather than two times. Again, the, the um, test duration is uh, 24 hours. After seven days, a visual inspection is uh, performed, and basically during the test and at the completion of tests, no disassembly or fire shall occur. The T8 test is known as the forced discharge test. Basically, this is to evaluate the ability of a discharge cell to withstand a a forced discharge condition. Basically, the cell is connected to a 12 volt power supply with uh, appropriate load resistor. How you calculate what the appropriate uh, load resistor should be um, is basically the load resistor should be appropriate for the um, rate, should be appropriately rated for the test. So it should be rated for 12 volts and the maximum charge current as specified by the cell manufacturer. Um, the actual duration of test is, is basically calculated by dividing the rated capacity in amp hours against the maximum discharge current in amps. Uh, basically, after the test, it's left for uh, seven days, and after after the seven-day period, um, a visual inspection is performed to check that no disassembly or fire has occurred. So these t tests are quite extensive, and as we mentioned previously, the chemistry of lithium-ion has the potential to be quite volatile. So safety features are required in the battery pack and the cell. So the first safety feature would be a, 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 a vent or a vent plate, and basically what this does is it, um, when excessive build-up of pressure is inside the cell, uh, through abnormal heat generation or overcharging, for example, a vent is, pressure, uh, is present that allows the safe release of gas, um, which is shown in these diagrams here. The one to the left relates to uh, cylindrical cells, and the one on the right is a prismatic pack, which shows um, the exhaust valve or the vent plate. Another safety feature that's often used is the PTC. This acts as both a current fuse and a thermal fuse, so that when excessive current is drawn, resistance of the PTC increases, resulting in heat generation. Resistance of the PTC is 
selected so that it trips a predetermined current. So again, you need to look at the specification of both the cell and the pack to ensure that an appropriate uh, trip current is actually specified for the PC PTC. We mentioned earlier on the separator, which had the important function of separating the anode and the cathode. Uh, it also acts as a safety device too. Uh, when the separator reaches a defined temperature, typically 130 degrees, the pores are blocked by the melting of the material. So this prevents current flow between the electrodes. Um, sometimes the separator is known as the shutdown separator. When thermal runaway occurs, quite often the temperature is so extreme that the actual separator actually melts or shrinks which then allows the two electrodes, the anode and the cathode, to actually come into contact with each other. A thermal fuse device is um, quite often used in prismatic uh, batteries. This is an additional feature, and basically the prime function of the thermal fuse is to limit the current under a fault condition such as a short circuit. As I mentioned earlier on, protection circuitry is, is, is a key um, safety feature of, of a battery pack. Basically, this battery pack, um, this PCM or protection circuit module, basically is um, a typical circuit that would be used for a one-cell uh, battery pack. Uh, and basically, the idea is, is basically it monitors the control IC monitors the cell and prevents over discharge, overcharge conditions. So basically, most uh, cell manufacturers recommend that you don't charge beyond uh, 4.3 volts or around that 4 to 4.3 volts. So basically, you specify an overcharge voltage limit based on the cell specification. It also has an over-discharge function, which is typically, say, 2.5, 2.7 volts, whereby the manufacturer of the cell recommends you don't discharge below that value. Overcurrent is also protection is also provided in the form of the PTC. The combination of the two FETs basically controls the charge and the discharge. There's also typically a temperature sensing device, which is normally a thermistor, which is basically uh, uh, there to ensure that the charging doesn't occur over a set temperature. Uh, so the charging IC will then uh, shut down the, the charging function uh, to prevent overcharging or charging at excessive temperature. Uh, for, for more complex systems that involve uh, multi-cells, a more complex system is required, um, which is basically um, a battery management system, which maybe includes uh, communication protocols such as SM bus or CAN, which basically means um, there's uh, data transfer between the pack and the, uh, and the end product to ensure that these parameters such as overcharge, over discharge are kept within parameters. It also does things such as um, voltage sensing, so it basically monitors the voltage of individual cells um, within the battery pack to make sure they aren't excessively charged or discharged in, in an individual basis. And basically, there are many aspects to consider when designing power management or protection circuitry. Um, one of them is uh, ambient temperature to make sure that you check that the charging and discharging is prohibited in excessive temperatures, whether they're high temperatures or low temperatures. Another thing to consider is also um, radiated heat from components in the proximity of the pack. So if you know there's a particular hot area in your design, it's best to locate the battery pack well away from those areas. As mentioned before, you need to have overcharge, over discharge, over current protection, as well as over voltage protection. Another uh, design feature that is uh, important is algorithm design. So basically are the correct voltages or current supplied at the correct stages of the charge cycle for the correct duration of time and under the correct conditions. So some battery systems may have a trickle charge function, 
So the algorithm will dictate when this triple charge, which is basically low current charging, um, basically occurs. So basically triple charge is when it meets, it goes down to the very low limit of the specification. It trickle charges up to a certain limit, and then the algorithm will then initiate the full charge sequence. Another area to consider is uh, short circuit avoidance. So it's basically to minimize accidental short circuit, maybe the detachment of wires in the proximity of the battery, separation, separation distances between tracks and pads on the, on the PCM or surrounding area to make sure that uh, there's no short circuit, short circuit occurrence. Um, another thing is, is leakage protection. It's basically, if the battery cell leaks, the electrolyte that's present is corrosive and conductive. So if there's no segregation between the cell and the protection circuitry, you've got the potential for the electrolyte of the cell to corrode or create short circuits on the, on the protection module and, and so defeat the purpose of it. As we mentioned earlier on, um, the cell bent is an important design feature to um, let the release of um, gas under fault conditions. Um, it's important in the end application that this cell bend is not actually blocked or restricted. So um, a clear uh, bent path needs to be um, created within the actual battery pack, which is typically important if you decide to um, pot uh, your um, cell use potted material in your cell uh, in your battery pack design and that you don't actually block off the actual vent. Uh, user instructions are also important. It's always important to educate the end user as to the potential risks and hazards that are involved. So appropriate instructions to reduce, reduce hazards to the user and which might also result to damage of the product should it result in a, a safety hazard. For example, identifying the maximum ambient conditions of use for the product, identifying the correct battery charger or power adapter to use, and to uh, give details of what the correct disposal of the product is at the end of its life. So, it's, so for example, um, not to place it in a, in a, in a uh, compactor or something like that where it could get shorted out and um, crushed or not to chuck it on something like a fire or something like that. So then there's obviously the explosion hazard. Um, as mentioned before, multi-cell packs are obviously more complex, so they need more advanced battery management systems to control higher voltages and current. Often this involves individual cell monitoring of voltages and stuff like that. And that tends to use more complicated uh, control language, such as SMBUS and CAM protocols. Um, basically, it's good to remember um, to, for the robustness of the design, it should be verified under normal and uh, fault conditions. So you have a, basically a robust design which covers, as well as performance, the actual safety of the product.